Welcome to CS Week Women in Utilities webinar series. I am Denise Mullendore with CS Week, and I will be your moderator along with Andrea Pelt Thornton from Florida Power and Light, who will be moderating our question and answer session today. Mark your calendars for CS Week and Conference 40. It will be held on April 25th through the 29th at the Phoenix Convention Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Register now for csweek.org and sign up for the complimentary Women in Utilities reception Tuesday evening. Today's program will be recorded and available for playback along with our other archive presentations later this afternoon. You will find it by selecting Women in Utilities tab under the Webinars menu choice on the CS Week homepage. Attendees are encouraged to upload questions to the Q&A panel as they arrive. However, we will hold all questions until after the presentation for the Q&A segment. Please ensure that you address your questions to all panelists so that we may see them. Today's panel is Women-Focused Employee Resource Groups. Our panelists today are Jessica Brahaney kane Vice President of Eversource Customer Operations at Eversource Energy. Hilda Penix Raglan, she's the Vice President of Corporate Public Affairs at Duke Energy. And Kate Stingle, Vice President of Internal Auditing at Florida Power and Light, Next Era Energy. Thank you ladies for joining us today. Jessica, take it. Thank you so much. So I'm very pleased to be here today um, with this, a group of women who are interested in this topic. I think uh, advancing, uh, advancing the potential of, for women in our industry is a huge opportunity. Um, I'm a big supporter overall of, of diversity and inclusion and know that whether it's um, generations or different backgrounds or, um, or uh, just different perspectives from where you grew up. I think all of that feeds into a better ultimate solution and there's actually dollar value behind it. So um, I titled my presentation Getting Started because I thought I'd take the angle with this group of sharing how to, how to launch um, a group. I knew that there'd be a lot of information about how to keep it going, but I included in here some, some actionable takeaways and templates for people if they're looking to get, to get started in their own company. And with that, I'll pull us to who our company is, which is Eversource. Uh, we we're previously known as Northeast Utilities or Connecticut Light and Power and Star Electric, public service company in New Hampshire and Omico. And about a year ago, we rebranded, so we are now Eversource. We've got 3.6 million electric and natural gas customers in New England, and we're our largest energy deliver, delivery company in New England. And I'll move us to the next slide. So um, for what and why, so in, at Eversource we have, I've actually had uh, launched our women's group twice, once pre-merger for just Connecticut Light and Power and then um, the second time was last year for Eversource in Connecticut. We have evolved the actual name, it was previously Women's Employee Resource Group, but we wanted to make sure we were tying the group um, to the value, to the business value, so that's, we actually changed the name to Women's Business Resource Group just in the last few months. Our mission is to help women reach their full potential by attracting, retaining, and developing talent. Um, and why? Why is that important? For several reasons, I, I've seen um, the decks from some of my, my, my panel peers, and I could see there's additional data around this, but financial performance improves ability to attract, retain, and develop uh, talent. Uh, there's more innovation when there are more diverse perspectives, including gender diversity, and then group morale, group performance and morale improve. Um, and specifically, I grabbed the strongest, most memorable um, business case nugget that, that we'd used in our kickoffs, which was around a Credit Suisse study that had captured that companies with more female executives earned a 27% higher ROE and a 42% higher dividend payout. So um, most things we do, we like to ground it with a business case, and this one really does have a business case. I'll just share that in launching the effort here at Eversource, we had um, assigned a number of people to go out and meet with our executives to see if they were bought in, how much they were bought in, and we found a lot of passion behind it, but also really unanimous support for the business case behind this, which was great. Maybe a little surprising, maybe not in today's age, but um, I think that was great. 
So who is involved and uh, how are they involved? Um, obviously this is very difficult if at a company if your CEO does not support it, so it has to come from top down. Our Chief Human Resource Officer here at Eversource is our executive sponsor. Um, prior to the Eversource merger, I did launch it at Connecticut Light and Power. And we were able to get some good momentum, but having that top-down support and kind of structural governance in the organization design does um, improve the ability of the group to kind of gain traction and impact. Um, we also have about a year and a half ago, we hired a manager of um, diversity and inclusion. And so uh, she is responsible for diversity and inclusion, our business resource groups overall, and this women's group. She kind of coordinates, you know, solicits interests and kind of creates the groups across the three states and keeps the momentum going. We also have an executive steering committee of owners. Um, so we're in three states and we wanted to make sure there was kind of local, local, um, ownership and knowledge of what was needed differently in each of our states because we're still not all the same culture, nor will we probably ever be. But having that steering committee support I think makes a significant difference. What made the, the most difference um, in launching it, so I find mobilizing efforts is often the hardest part, sustaining them can be easier, and not in all cases, but in most. Um, I'll offer that with our working leadership team, that was the, the key picks. Um, Meaning we actually used internally, we have a group uh, that's identified each year of key talent, say people within the top 5% who are identified as ones who would move up in the company. And we were able to get that list of people and pick from that people to put them on our launch team. So we duly, by grabbing that group, you know you've got an A team, but we also took those people and gave them an opportunity to get them exposed to officers across the company. So it was really a win-win in, um, in getting us off the ground. Um, key roles, corporate communication and administrative support. So um, communication is key for this, whether it's um, the, the invites that go out to people or the uh, reporting about the progress in in whatever actions and support that you're providing. And then the administrative support, this can't be underestimated. You, um, there's a lot of administrative logistics when you're trying to get this mobilized and even steady state going forward for securing the room and all of the and the audiovisual logistics and the coffee and tea and all that. And you really don't want your, your directors and your managers um, needing to be dedicating their limited time on that those administrative pieces. So we did bring administrative assistants, executive assistants actually into the working team and had them have one per state who's, uh, who's dedicated. That made a huge difference and was a satisfier for, for the leadership team. Um, so what do we focus on? So we have the who and that group meets still monthly now. It's about a year into the launch where we went from three states into one state, but really three areas, networking events, where um, the goal is really to create a forum for people to get to know each other and uh, to learn from those who are further ahead in their career. But we do one large one in each state annually and a small one quarterly in each state. And the large ones um, have a different structure than the small ones and I did include in the appendix kind of a sample of what those large ones look like. And the smaller networking events, um, those are very local, often in remote remote, more remote area work centers, and that's where the training, education, and development um, content comes into place. So the second, say, sub-team that we have is our TED team, and we task them with providing events in a box, meaning the content in a box. So it could be an actual TED talk, or it could be a lean-in video from Sheryl Sandberg, or it could be the Linda Babcock, um, a chapter from her Women Don't Ask book, but kind of preparing um, company supported content to have a discussion about to make it a little bit more comfortable and productive when, when we do have those small uh, sessions together and that's been, been very effective. Um, and then mentoring, so out of our first several large events where we launched, this came up as a huge request and we really didn't have a structure around this. Um, often mentoring can be a, not work out so well if you, um, if it goes on infinitely, if they're, um, if there isn't the right match. So this specific mentoring program has uh, specific goals and a set duration. So um, the people who are signing up to be mentored have defined the goals up front, um, a set duration so that once they've met those goals with their mentor that then they, um, they can get 
that relationship ends. So I think that that those are some win-wins, and we're still early in mobilizing that. It's kind of a revived program that we had had years ago that were uh, due to the interest we revived. So those are the three the three main things that our business resource group for women does. And I'll pull us to some next slide on lessons learned. Um, just overall, we find participants really value hearing the authentic journeys of and advice from women further along in their careers, um, that people really need help and, and appreciate the guidance of providing an informal structure to get to know each other in each forum, so a, a structured icebreaker, not just allowing time for people to talk to each other, but kind of give them something to talk about. Um, Within the actual business resource group, defining and getting agreement on those clear roles and responsibilities, you're using, um, you know, it's an additional role for, for most people who are on the working groups, and uh, nobody likes, people want need to be efficient, want to be efficient, and yet want to support this. So that, that is a, a lesson learned when that, um, we had some, some, some challenges in that area. I talked about picking your working team from key talent, if you can. Events in a box, uh, just again, keeps it efficient, and then um, enlisting the strong administrative support. Those would be the key lessons learned, and I'm only going to touch slightly on the next few slides, so I just thought, um, moving us ahead to slide 11, um, I've got three examples, and so slide 12 would be for, this is what we've used and tweaked with the, we survey after every major, after every large event, and with that feedback, this time frame and the duration seems to be what's worked well for us um, for the kickoff. And then the next one, as far as table talk, tabletop exercise, it's not rocket science, just a little bit of structure for people to get to know each other and learn from each other goes a long way. And then the last one, um, I just grabbed, I went through the last few last, uh, events, major events that we had, and grab people's favorites and least favorites. Um, so they love the executive panel discussions that are facilitated. We do that up on a stage um, so people can see them. They like the networking at the tables, and this is again in just the large events. They want, and we think we struggle with how to how to more, most productively integrate males into the sessions. Um, even as I looked at attendees today, it's um, how do we, you know, how do we get men kind of helping to, to drive and pull, uh, pull in the same direction, and um, and I think people want time for question and answers and ending on time. I put that one in here because I think as you're supporting a diverse workforce, if you have people, if you're going late at the end of the day, people need to get home. And they said this at the end of one of our first meetings. They, they do have commitments, and part of respecting diversity is allowing people to get home to take care of their their family, their parents, their kids, um, whatever that is. So I think it's very mo even more important than normal to end on time in um, in these events. And that is what I have for uh, our women's business resource group. Um, nuggets in a box. And I'll pass to Hilda. Okay, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, I too am very excited about joining you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I have about six slides and it will be really um, enthusiastically uh, ready for questions because I think it's in the dialogue is where we really um, grab some nuggets that we can put in place for the future meetings for our business resource groups. Okay, so I'm with Duke Energy, and I've actually been with the uh, women network groups and actually was here when then Progress Energy kicked off the, uh, what I would say, employee resource groups. Uh, Duke kicked them off around 2006, and Progress kicked them out, uh, kicked them off uh, several years before that. Um, one women in network, and today we are business women network. So what's Duke? And um, you would move on to the next slide. Uh, Duke Energy is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, integrated utilities in the United States. We've been around for over 150 years, Fortune 250, headquartered in Charlotte, about 28,000 employees, and uh, dividends, and I heard that before, uh, we actually have um, been able to yield or really 
provide dividends for 88 consecutive years, which is important. Always to look at that ROE, and so I really love that stat that was just mentioned by uh, Jessica. We have six regulated states. We are in the south, we are in the midwest, um, and so we cover a, a broad area. And in addition, we have a nice footprint in South America, primarily in Peru and in Brazil. Uh, we do have some in Central America. We are actually all over the United States in buildings. So 7.3 million uh, what we call retail customers are really 23 million lives are impacted, uh, 500,000 natural gas customers really in Ohio and Kentucky, but today we're really in the, uh, we just uh, announced the acquisition of Piedmont, so we're in Tennessee, North Carolina, um, and some other states as well, uh, especially once that merger, uh, that acquisition closes. So we have, uh, we're in all facets of energy, and um, just moving forth uh, for the company, I think it's very important to hear where the CEO stands. And I have been with the company uh, and its different entities for over 36 years, running operations, internal audit, and many other facets of the business. Uh, the CEO drives heavily the diversity lens of a company and its direction. And I'm very pleased to say, and it gives me great joy, that Lynn Good, a female, is our CEO, uh, an incredible leader who happens to be a female. She says, uh, and I really love her, her thought around this, she believes that diverse teams make us better teams with diverse skills, experiences, and backgrounds. And when we bring it together, our, all of those different perspectives, our decision making becomes much, much better, more constructively challenging one another to go to higher um, levels of thinking, creating innovative solutions that move us forward. Um, so I think she really sets that tone. And so diversity is, is critically important for our overall success. Financially, from our customers, from our communities, it's just important. So where does, um, when you look at Duke, uh, you must say, so where in the world do you stand? But I think it's important if you go to um, page three to take a look at the industry. I've um, uh, I'm an ex-auditor, too, so Jessica, I heard your uh, internal audit. I think it's you, Jessica. Um, when you look at the stats with 2015 by Catalyst, um, and it says women in S&P 500 utilities, this is very interesting, and then I'll give you our stats. 43.8% um, uh, industry labor force. And then you look at 6.7% CEOs, 20% hold board, board seats. Uh, and that's an area that's woefully underrepresented uh, when you look at it. Then when you look at the executive levels and all of that. Um, but when I look at the EEI table, that's the Edison Electric Institute table, there are very few women uh, around the table. So those are the catalyst data. Uh, that. And I have those back for a couple of years. Moving now to page four. So where is Duke Energy in this whole, um, what I say, business women network circle, and that's what we call ours, BWN, and everyone has a, an acronym. Um, we have seven chapters. It is by far the largest employee resource group that we have. So women do engage. We are in all of our states, um, and I would say except South Carolina, but South Carolina employees are, are really in close proximity to uh, Charlotte. We do have one at a nuclear plant. We have them out in the field. 
Um, so seven very active chapters. Um, we have um, looked at it from uh, benefits to the company, what's in it for the company and what's in it for the employee. Because often we get the question of, so why do you have that? And we all need to identify why. Well, when you look at the benefits to the company, it definitely increases, and we have tangible results here, increases employee engagement. So our employee survey, employee satisfaction survey, clearly says that those employees that are engaged in ERGs, or employee resource groups, are more actively engaged and are happier and more satisfied than those who are not engaged. So that's a good metric for all of us. Um, it definitely helps with uh, attraction and retention. Um, it helps uh, the company for opportunities for employees to grow and develop their skills. They can do it within the ERG. Um, it helps them gain insight into different areas of the business, um, different geographic areas of the business, because we actually do come together as a big EWN ERG and as company ERGs, and that helps. And what we're seeing more today is ERGs are coming together, and we have several, LGBT, and I know all of you have many of these as well, but they're all coming together and doing joint activity. So what's in it for the employee? Um, and I'll say there are several objectives here, but you really get that stronger network for long-term and short-term, exposure to leadership. And I heard what you're doing um, with the leadership, the executives. We actually have that type of panel as well, and we call it, uh, it's almost executive um, dating game, and that's been very, very uh, popular. Uh, career development, team building, uh, so what are the objectives? I'll say there are four, professional and development, education and awareness. And this is one that's really key for us. Study after study says that we as energy, um, energy companies need to get more engaged and educate our community more. And we have found that the ERGs by far um, can actually, and they have a higher reach, a deeper reach, and they actually can advance um, that whole mission for us. And we've tested it in many cases once we teach them. And many of them have signed up to be what we call Duke ambassadors. They are out there communicating with their neighbors, communicating with the community, and have been assigned several uh, certain key organizations for us. Um, we have a big recognition and awards within it, and they actually is very intense. So there are lots of uh, objectives and benefits that have been uh, derived from it. Let's moving, uh, move on to page five. Uh, so let's talk about what in the world have we done. <clears throat> and we have done so much, it's hard to actually just say one particular thing. And each chapter, while they have an overall um, arching, overarching vision of what we want to get delivered, some key initiatives, they actually do several things on their own. Um, so the programming is where they really focus, community outreach. Um, uh, internal, uh, and it may be something that is specific only to to women. For an example, many years ago, I remember several women wanted to have a designated place for um, nursing. That was a specific thing. Certain women wanted to have a uh, more information about nuclear or about financials. Um, so we had programs targeted for more education for them. Then there's another whole piece for the company, and many of them are having those sessions with uh, solar energy, with um, new generation sources, or with um, 
at the one time it was the smart grid, or most recently, and every group has done this, they've invited our VP of Environmental in, and she's actually presented on the new EPA laws with respect to, uh, to carbon um, and environment. So we have, um, and, and we've seen people get more actively engaged in that. Uh, we are getting a growth in our chapters as well. Um, I think that's all I'll say there. We can, uh, I'll be glad to answer questions, um, except, well, two things. One is the, uh, we really needed to reach out to the Hispanic community. And the way we really did that was through our um, ERG, Employee Resource Group for Hispanics. In fact, we today are much better uh, positioned than we were before as a result of it because of those contacts, because of just understanding some of the, um, the language and everything. So it was really good. Um, the last thing on page six, our recommended best practices, and I agree with many that were mentioned earlier. Succession planning. We recommend you should always have a succession plan for your ERG leadership uh, leaders, your teams. And having that president, the vice president, the treasurer, the programs person, all well trained. And you need to take it a step further. You need to make sure they have full support of their management. And one of the things we did this year, I sent a letter out to everyone, and I'm the executive sponsor, and then there is a SMC leader, that's a senior management leader, who is actually the sponsor of each one of the chapters. So we have a personal um, interest and we have accountability. It is a part of our accountability. Um, so mine is to make sure I take responsibility for all and make sure they're actively engaged and when there's something wrong or it's something they need attention to, to address it. Um, the ERG leaders should possess some leadership skills. And if they're not really honed in and um, this deep leadership skills, I'll say, we need to make sure they strengthen those. Um, it's great to have a diverse skill set there, but we need to make sure you do have a leader with some skills. Uh, we must be creative in how we engage our members. Just because someone is perceived as passive does not mean they want, they don't want to work. So it's being creative around that whole area. Keeping the communication channels open uh, with your membership and your sponsors, making sure both are actively engaged. Um, and that we get the feedback we need, two-way uh, feedback through surveys or whatever is needed. Engaging and leveraging your sponsors. And I must say, there's no problem here for, for hours. They have no problem asking for funds or saying, do you know a speaker? Or um, I need your guidance on this. Uh, and we actually can make a difference for the um, membership. So making sure, again, that the ERG leaders, their sponsors, their executive sponsors, and their management is well informed. And I think that's it for Duke for the most part. But I'm um, looking forward to the questions. Thanks so much. Hello. Should I go ahead and get started? All right. My name is Kate Stengel. I'm the Vice President of Internal Auditing at NextEra Energy, also known as Florida Power and Light. Um, 
I'm really energized by hearing all of these other women leaders talk about how we can do a better job of, of developing our, our female talent. We've certainly come a really long way in the time that I've been in the workforce, but certainly there's, there's more we can do, and I'm glad to see that there's such an interest by so many women here today to hear, to hear about what we, what we can do. Um, at the risk of repeating what's already been shared, I only have three slides, so we'll be able to get quickly to question and answers, which has been said by Hilda, I think will be really, really exciting. But certainly, as we have talked about, research shows that networking among our peers is one of the most productive ways that we can enhance our career possibilities and our personal development. And our journey at Next Era has, has I think, um, been pretty parallel with this. We first did a company-wide employee engagement survey. I believe it was in the late 2000, um, or in the, about the 2008 timeframe. And what we heard overwhelmingly um, from the results of that and from the consultant who performed that survey was that we needed to form employee resource groups so that com uh, employees felt more connected to each other. Um, and I think maybe Hilda spoke about this earlier, but certainly research shows that people who are engaged are more, more likely to say good things about the company, stay at the company, and then more importantly, strive at the company and, and really um, try to do as much as they, as much as they can um, while they're here. And, and, and really, we have found that by forming several employee resource groups at NextEra, we've, we've found a benefit of that. We have about 11 employee resource groups at NextEra Energy, um, but I believe we was one of the first ones, and ours is called Women in Energy, or WE. That was uh, one of the first ERGs that was formed, and I believe it's one of the largest. So we'll go ahead and go to my first slide, which talks a little bit about who NextEra is. NextEra Energy is our parent company. We have two primary businesses. One is the regulated utility, electric utility, based in South Florida. And then our second piece is a primarily deregulated company that operates in 27 states and Canada. Up at the top, you'll just see some of our statistics about our parent company. We're a big company, about 14,000 employees, close to $50 million in market cap. That's an outdated number, so it's probably a little bit bigger. About 45,000 megawatts in operations, and that's getting bigger every day. Our first big segment of our company is called Florida Power and Light, and it's the largest individual utility in terms of electric sales. We are in South Florida, as I stated, so people use lots of electricity in South Florida. It's quite balmy here most of the year. We have about 4.7 million customers for Florida Power and Light. And then Next Air Energy Resources is really everything that's outside the Florida footprint, and we are very pleased to say that we're the, um, one of the leaders in the world in electricity that's generated from the wind and the sun. We're very committed to renewable resources, but we have other types of generation too. And then along the bottom, of course, we have our corporate functions that support really the entire part of our, of our business. So we can move to the next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, our Women's Employee Resource Group is called Women in Energy, and we call it WE. It was formed in 2009. So just a bit of an overview about WE. We have a, a mission statement that was actually recently repurposed, and I'll talk about that again in a minute. But our mission statement now is to advance the careers of its members, and we accomplish this by providing industry education, professional networking, and corporate benchmarking. We have approximately 200 members, and that's in three different locations. We have, in, in 2015, just to give a bit of an overview about the types of events that we did, we hosted about 18 events and covered various topics similar to some of the other groups that we've talked about today, but business and personal development, community support, and advocacy topics. And we typically have an average of about 50 people per, attend, uh, per event, some smaller and, and some certainly larger, but that's about on average our attendance. We do have committee chairs that are elected annually. And this helps with some of the administrative burden I know that was spoken about um, earlier. We try to divide the tasks among, um, among the people who have the greatest interest in helping, helping our, our ERG. And currently, our largest chapter has about seven, seven committees. The smaller ones have between four and five, but we certainly try to share the, the joy of, of, of getting to plan some of our events and make sure that they go off without a hitch. We have one executive sponsor. I'm serving as the executive sponsor now. I've recently taken that over over the last year, and I'm certainly pleased and energized to do so. And then in 2016, one of the things that we're starting to do, and I, and I heard this talked about earlier by one of the other panelists, is that we are also forming a WE Leadership Council of four to five other female executives. And that's also just to help make sure that we have um, visual support from other leaders in the company to help make sure that we're able to, to achieve and to um, increase interest in our, in our ERG. So moving to the last page. Thank you. So just some tips and lessons learned. First, 
I think it's, and we've heard about this too, it's good to have a nice mix of, of different events, and I think we certainly do that and, and continue to try to do more of that going forward. But having individual guest speakers talk, one thing that we did last year for the first time and we're starting to do is to have our female board of director members come in and speak at one of our, at our WE events. We called it, you know, in the boardroom, and, and as was said earlier, people really like to hear about the, the career paths and what were some of the best things you learned and maybe mistakes that you've made from people who are, who are certainly seen as being very successful and our board of directors um, have been very willing to do that. We had one last year, we'll do one this year, we'll have one next year and that's been great. But in addition to the board members, we have other female executive leaders. And we do that both um, in, in a formal setting, which I'll say, which is in our, our largest um, auditorium space here on, on our main campus, but also we've done different breakfasts too, which is a smaller crowd, but still with the same topic and, and certainly I think both are good. We've had panel discussions, as others have talked about, um, to talk about various topics, both just career development, but also business updates, really what's happening at our company um, on different topics that are of interest, and I, and I think others have done that, done that as well, because we do find that our members are, of course, interested in personal development, but part of how you develop your, your, your ability is by knowing what's going on both in the company and in the industry, and we certainly found this to be something that's important. Um, workshops, and then also informal gatherings, um, happy hours or whatever that may be, and then different community service events, all of which I think are, are good, and to have a nice mix of that is something that um, I think is important for us. Second is um, a focus, you know, to making sure that the events that you're doing really support your overall mission. It is easy to get distracted, and I put the just the adjective with other, other shiny topics or kind of the topic du jour, and, and I think really making sure that the events that you're doing are in line with what your ultimate goal is, I think is, is important to make sure that we don't get too, too far off track. Um, you know, as I mentioned, our, our, our ERG, we was formed in 2009, and just like anything, I think it's sometimes things can, can start to feel a little bit stale, and so you, it's good to kind of shake things around and, and every so often and look at things and see if we need to say something a little bit differently or reach out a little bit differently or tap into something maybe we haven't done before. So I certainly encourage, you know, with, periodically or, or every several years just to kind of review your mission statement and the events that you've done to determine if we need to do something differently or mix it up a little bit to keep things exciting. Um, and also, certainly, you can use all the corporate communication channels that our companies have to be able to continuously advertise and remind employees about the ERG. And then lastly, I'd just like to say that I think it's important to, um, since our ERGs are supposed to represent our large our, our entire employee population, to make sure that there is a good member representation. And you may have to actively recruit, and we have to do that too sometimes, to make sure that we have representation from some of our underrepresented business units or locations to make sure that everybody everybody feels represented. So that's really what I have to share today. Um, it's been great so far, certainly learned quite a bit from the other panelists and really look forward to the Q&A session. Wow, ladies, thank you so much for some very exciting and dynamic and informative presentations. We do have several questions and so we will jump right in, uh, stepping from Kate, your last statement. And um, so there's one question that we will have for Jessica. Jessica, can you share what support did you receive in advance to ensure broad cross-functional participation from uh, your, your uh, employees? Great, thank you. Uh, Maya Newton. Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, so in advance, um, one of the things we wanted to get are women who are out in the area work centers doing our field work, because we knew that that was where we had the lowest percentage of women and, a, and kind of a big opportunity. So we did go out in advance. We sent our working team out of key talent to meet with our operations uh, vice presidents and then brought that down to the directors to ensure that the directors and the managers provided support for our operations women and men, but operations women and men in the field um, to be able to join our events. And then in addition, we, knew, we know that operations end their day, their work, they start earlier and end earlier, so that's why we picked the end of the day, knowing that that wouldn't interrupt, um, interrupt the normal workflow. Um, and then last, but definitely not least, to ensure high participation for the events, we found that the standard 
um, say the, the daily email that comes out through corporate communications, for example, with updates and information about the company, that that did not get <clears throat> nearly, might have gotten 10% of the uh, participation as when we had um, an officer send a message out. So we had IT give us the full list of employees in the state of Connecticut, a different officer in Massachusetts and a different, different one in uh, in New Hampshire and actually emailed out the group as a, as a meeting invitation. And that um, emailing gets a higher participation than the, than the standard, you know, daily um, an email from an officer versus email from Corpcom got a much higher participation, but email as a meeting invitation got the highest participation. And most of our folks in the field actually have access to email, uh, but some don't. So we also had the administrative assistants out in the area work centers post um, on the walls in the area work centers, that there was support, um, the management support for joining these sessions, and here's when it would be, and please, you know, talk to your supervisor, but we wanted to make sure that um, that we, we reached our people in the field, and that's, uh, so it was a, a number of things we did, but I think that made, that got participation up so that we had a higher level of participants from the field um, at the meeting than we do overall at our company. So I think that at the meetings, that's, uh, I think that was a success. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. So our next question is for Hilda, and one of our panelists, I'm sorry, one of our participants would like to know if your community ambassadors are men and women, and if so, how and how do you identify these individuals to keep them engaged? Oh, I love that question, um, and I and noticed it came from an EY person, and I did not uh, say that uh, Duke Energy was actually recognized as having, uh, as the number one company in terms of women in executive leadership role. And EY did the study, and I just thought, you know, thanks, EY. Great job, but it's more important for all of us to, to continue and sustain that. But in terms of the ambassadors, that's actually a part of if what I worked on, or not I, but the my department worked on. And when we had a, a summit of all ERGs, I asked the question of what can we do uh, better. And, and if you really stop and listen, one of the things was to bring back Duke ambassadors. And so that recommendation came from a male. Our BWN members are male and female. And more female, of course, but the males are actively engaged. The leadership is engaged. And I will always think of Cincinnati because the leadership is directly engaged, and many are men in, in that area. So um, how did we identify them? We asked if they were interested in working in the community. And those that wanted to be engaged in the community and be ambassadors on Duke's behalf, uh, they stepped up. We actually trained them, and we gave them good, strong communications, good, strong uh, issues management, identifying the top three issues in the company. And we actually feed them information via the, the um, email as things happened, and they communicated to neighbors, uh, or we have this thing called when neighbors ask. Or many of them are what we call strategic relationship managers, and they actually have these certain organizations they go out to providing information and given periodically as things happen, like we recently had a storm, sending information, sending uh, safety tips, um, just FYI, in case you didn't know, the same thing happens, they, this organization or the organization will reply, and they will provide feedback, feedback and input. That's really one of the best practices that I have seen, because it's real tangible, and it's something that we need. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. It sounds uh, very comprehensive. Thank you. 
So our next question is for Kate. And Kate, you shared in your presentation that you have a great mix of individual guest speakers. Can you provide us with a sense of um, who some of those speakers may have been, internal, external? Um, I think you mentioned that you have had board members to speak. Any sure, other sure. Uh, persons of interest? Yeah, happy to answer. And again, I'm, I'm speaking with, with some limited limited history, but um, yeah, as I mentioned, we've had our board of directors, um, speakers that went, went very, very well. Um, that was also, it was also good for those events too, because we had all of our senior leadership present at those, at those events. So I think it was another way for um, our employee population to see that, that all of our senior leaders support, support the, the resource group. So that's certainly one. But we've had other, other panels. Um, with our our leaders in, in our operations field and our financial fields. One thing I think it's important to say, and we've heard this too, is that our panels aren't always all all female. We do ask some of our of our male executives to, to participate too. Um, and again to show to show support for, for our for our, our employee resource group and to show that it's not just a female thing, that really that all employees are are invited to attend and we certainly certainly believe that. Um, Primarily, our speakers are internal. I know we've had other external speakers at some time at some time come, but um, what I have have seen and, and heard from anecdotally is that employees really like to hear from um, from some of our internal leaders. Um, so we we try to keep most of our of our speakers internal. But I think it's a really broad cross mix. We try to have um, all different parts of our operations and our businesses represented again. So we're not just showing off one one part of our business, but you know whether it's HR, whether it's in our operating business units, whether it's in our financial communities, whether it's in um, some of our compliance roles, male, female, different levels. We try to have a really a really nice mix, and we think that 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 diversity and mix really helps. Wonderful, thank you. Another question that we're seeing frequently is regarding reading lists. And so I'd like to invite uh, either or any of our panelists to share your thoughts on recommended reading, like uh, the Lean In book by Sheryl Sandberg. Do either of your groups support or provide reading lists? Yes, we actually have a uh, book, um, I would call it the book club with N, the BWN chapters, many of them, and they have read many different books, primarily those linking to um, business and leadership um, from older books such as The World is Flat and many of Tom Friedman's to the 25, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership to, um, I would say, owning up or boards that deliver or the boys club um, and it's called breaking into the boys club um, but they have read many things one of the things that and I, I think I need to highlight is Carla Harris who is with Morgan Stanley um, spoke and we actually have a, a big group that will host key outside speakers, including some of our board members, but it was strategized to win. Uh, the new way to start out, step up, and start over in your career. And she is the author of Expect to Win. And so that would be the one that I would highlight is um, if you haven't read it, give it a try. This is Jessica. I think um, I'm, I captured a number of good reading lists uh, from you, so thank you for that. I think with a lot of the commuting that we do, we've um, we've gotten into sharing um, audio the audio book version as well. But um, two that we that we've used historically, the Women Don't Ask book, and this is probably early 2000s, but by Linda Babcock, and it really um, makes it clear that a lot of the reason that women are not advancing as fast as men and that we're only making, you know, that 73 cents on the dollar is uh, we don't know the market value of our work. We're not as comfortable negotiating. We don't negotiate. We feel um, on average, this is all on average, on average, um, un uncomfortable 
and, and it's kind of like going to the dentist to have to negotiate something versus men feel like, you know, I'm going to go tackle this. I'm going to go, you know, it's kind of like a game. So she gives a lot of data. She's, uh, she's from Harvard, uh, Harvard researcher. The other one, more recent, but it's easily accessible in a women's business resource group would be um, the Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, she's got like a, a 20, maybe 15 minute TED talk. So if you're not going to read the whole book, I think even just that the TED talk um, is is good as well. But those would be the two that I'd suggest. Fantastic! Wow, this is this is uh, so impactful. Our next question is with respect to a sponsorship, and the question is, how are these groups funded, corporately or by executive sponsors? Uh, any panelists, feel free to share. Um, this, this is, is Kate. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, go I'm ahead, Hilda. Okay. Uh, at Duke, we actually are the company sponsors. Um, and I will say the executives and the uh, senior leadership will uh, provide any other resources often that they need. And this is Kate. At NextEra, we have, I guess, two primary, well, maybe three um, ways of, of having some, some funds into the organization. We do have a corporate budget that's allocated to all of the employee resource groups. We do actually ask our members to have a small fee to join. I think it's $20 to join the ERG, which helps with some of the, um, the smaller costs, the foods, and so forth. And then, yes, the executive sponsors, we also um, are able to provide a little bit of funding, too, for our different events, so really three different ways. And this is Jessica at Eversource. So we, last year was our first um, kickoff of, of, of this and trying to get our arms around what the funding would be. I think mostly it's the internal time for people, but we did have an external speaker or two. So I think it's mostly around, you know, the, the tea and coffee and maybe one or so additional uh, outside speaker a year. Um, but that does add, add up to, you know, maybe five to 10,000 for across our 6,000. People, so it's, it's light, and it is uh, primarily funded through HR, through our, um, through our Chief Human Resource Officer Diversity and Inclusion Group. Thank you very much. This is great perspective, great perspective. Um, the, the next question is, again, one for each of our panelists. And uh, we'll start uh, with you, Hilda, and I'll share why. But the question is, if you all could uh, elaborate on what you found to be your most successful um, activity, if you will, or, or one of your more fun activities. Uh, Hilda, you mentioned an intriguing aspect of the executive dating game. And so the question is simply, if each of you would share some of your more successful uh, activities and what made them special. Okay, uh, yes, I call it the executive uh, dating game. And it, it is amazing. You, We thought we wouldn't get initially several uh, executives, and, and literally every executive uh, that was on the chart was invited. And we, our response was overwhelming. Then we needed to make sure we had enough members to uh, to sign up, uh, but it um, we did get it, and we even invited others ERGs to participate. But that was extraordinarily successful. The what was interesting is, and they literally would go from table to table and signed and everything uh, with the table talk uh, topic, but the executives wanted to continue to do it year after year. The second one that I will um, highlight is um, the Charlotte chapter has a recognition. It started, and I uh, it started several years ago, and it recognizes um, and has two recognitions. But one recognized youth, they they honored two of their top. Uh, female execs, two of the first, I'll say. And each year, and it is amazing the competition here, and any executive, any woman in the company 
can actually be nominated. And this year was very, very challenging. We had EVPs, we had VPs, we had people from all ranks who were um, written up as potential honorees. And, and so this is a major honor. Uh, and what I would say the highest honor any female can receive in the company. And it was started by the BWN chapter. And so now you, you end up with 300 people attending this luncheon. Um, and then we have a huge, a really good one in Cincinnati. Um, they did have, they've always had this huge uh, event. They work collaboratively with other ERGs from other companies. And not only is it beneficial to Duke, it is beneficial for the entire uh, business community in Ohio. I think that's probably enough for me to say. <laughs> Thank you. Other in, uh, interesting events, ladies? Sure, I'll go. This is this is Kate Stingle. Um, I won't talk again about our, our board of director, our board of director presentation. That was certainly very very successful. Um, one that we've done several times that just always seems to draw a crowd is, is a panel discussion when we have women leaders talk about um, how they've gotten to where they are. Um, just their their career paths, and and I, I feel like that's one that 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 the topic, um, you know, as many times as we do it, if you've got different women up there with different perspectives, because everybody has a different story and different challenges and different nuggets to share, those are always, always very successful. And I think a panel is good because you get to hear several, and it's really nice to see the inter interaction between um, the executives with each other. Um, those are always really good. Another one that was a little bit off off of our of, of our message, but still had great attendance, um, and we participated with other employee resource groups. Was a really interesting panel on on child trafficking. We had outside speakers come in, and that was something like I said, a little bit outside the box. Uh, but sometimes that's good too, right? To to show and to maybe get some some people coming to your to your events that wouldn't necessarily come, and then they see the other types of events that that women in energy. Um, can provide, and so well, I think it's important to, to stay on your message most of the time. I think every once in a while doing something a little bit, a little bit different to maybe grab some people who wouldn't necessarily come is also is also a good thing. But all those all of those have been very successful for us. Phenomenal, phenomenal, outstanding. Jessica, Jessica, any thoughts from EverSource? Are you guys, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry, I thought I had lost. Um, so I think I'm gonna add to what Kate had said, but if you look at some of the comments afterwards for what participants liked with the executive panel, um, pieces of it that, that I think sometimes feel uncomfortable as you move up in your career, but it, it's hearing from other women that it doesn't feel comfortable um, every step of the way, and often you feel like an imposter at different steps, like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? Um, did they really select the right person? And kind of knowing um, that you're not alone in feeling that way, and then even the research that shows, you know, um, our counterparts, um, on average, and again, uh, on the male side, they'll be asking for that promotion or that corner office or that special project opportunity. Um, prior to being, say, what um, having already proven themselves in all those ways, and where women wait until they're fully qualified and feel like they fully know the area before asking for that, before feeling like they are, um, you know, able to step into those shoes. I think hearing from other women, it's kind of humbling, and it makes you not feel alone on on that. And then uh, you can see the comments as well. It's just on trusting your instincts. Um, and that it's okay to make a mistake along the way. If you're not making some mistakes, you're probably not, you know, reaching high enough for, for the right changes, for continuous change. So I think it's it's uh, it's that kind of feeling of connectedness that you can, can get up and down when you're hearing those panel discussions and those discussions at the table. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. These are so, so impactful. I'll now turn it over to Denise. We're right at the top of the hour. 
Yes, we are, and I want to respect everyone's time and go ahead and conclude uh, this session. But first of all, I just want to uh, let you know that if your question did not get answered, CS Week Office will forward the questions uh, to our presenters, uh, post the webinar, and follow up with you. Um, a quick question, a quick note before we uh, end the session was registration is now open online for CS Week 2016 in the Conference 40 in Phoenix. Early registration will end on March 1st, so visit csweek.org org or call the CS Week office and uh, we'll help you get registered today. Uh, also, I'd personally like to invite you to the Women in Utilities Networking Reception. This is a complimentary event that will be held on Tuesday evening of the CS Week. This is a great time to meet and network with each other and uh, that are, in, you know, each other that are in the utility industry there. The evening will feature door prizes, games, networking, and more. So we look forward to having you there. Be sure and register for that also. Again, I want to thank uh, Jessica, Hilda, and Kate and our webinar sponsor, AAC. Uh, utility partners, and all the attendees for joining us today. This will conclude our webinar. Thank you.